So today we'll talk about uh, model interpretation and feature selection. Oh, also, uh, thank you to everybody who filled out the um, midterm survey. The, the uh, class surveys are always uh, pretty uh, helpful, so make sure you fill this out again uh, at the end of the semester. So I want to start off with uh, model interpretation. And so this is sort of part of what people might call uh, understandable AI or understandable machine learning. The things that I want to talk about today are about post hoc explanations. So you could also go into a problem with the idea that you want an explainable model. And you would probably use different techniques, and there's techniques to find explainable models. But that's not what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Today is you have a model, and you want to understand what the model is doing. So to me, these are really uh, debugging tools that help you build better models, help you engineer features, find issues in your data. These are not really inference methods. You shouldn't think of them as, oh, my coefficient is high, therefore this is the, a thing in the real world. Um, it might hint to that, but this is not any kind of proof. So. Really um, be careful in terms of interpretation and really treat these more as like a way to open up the model and not as something that will actually tell you something about what's going on in the real world, which they might not, or they might be quite misleading. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what the different uh, issues can be. So, We'll talk about some different kinds of explanations. So these are all about explaining a model. None of them are about explaining a data set. So as I said before, this is, you're trying to understand what the, is the, the model doing. The first one is sort of the most general, which is explain this kind of model, which is um, say, how would this model change if this feature was dropped? So you don't actually look at a particular model that you fitted, you look at a family of models and you maybe change around the training data and see how the model reacts. Um, then a little bit more concrete, you can try to explain a model globally, which means you have a model um, that you fitted and you want to understand this particular model, what is it doing? An example here would be, in a linear model, look at the coefficients. So, and uh, often this takes the form of having some marginals, so you cannot really look at um, what does the model do in the original feature space because it's high dimensional, but you can try to figure out what is the model doing as a function of, say, one or two parameters, because then I can plot a curve. And maybe this projection will allow me to understand more about the model. And then finally, you can become even more concrete and you can ask, why did um, the model make this particular classification or regression on this particular data point? So you really want to ask, so the model made this decision, why did it make this decision? Again, this is useful for debugging. It can also be useful if you are a user-facing service to show the user why you made a certain decision. We saw this, I think, in the beginning with um, recommendations made by Amazon or Spotify to tell you why they recommend something. And a user might be more trusting or believe more in your recommendation if you tell them uh, why you made a certain um, prediction. You could also use this locally and say, okay, so you predicted my credit score is this, what do I need to change to get a higher credit score? So you can um, use this to like incentivize action in the real world. Though sort of the, the outcome is not guaranteed. So the 
I wanted to spend most of the lecture on uh, the second part where we're trying to explain a uh, model globally. And uh, in particular, we want to find out what are the features that are important to the model. The two things that we already saw and that are very widely used are um, for linear models, look at the coefficients. And for tree-based models, look at the feature importances. If you look at the uh, literature I posted for today, the reading, one of them was a blog post, Beware of Random Forest Default Feature Importances. And so this argues you should never use the second one. And um, there, there's uh, reasons why you might not want to use it. Both of these are statistics computed from the training set. So the feature importance is just as a reminder is the aggregate of how much did the impurity decrease using a given feature on the training set. So it's how much did this feature contribute to the um, to the decrease in impurity in a tree, and for gradient boosting or random forest, you just ensemble or just average it over all the trees. If you want to ask um, what features are important um, in a linear model, and you look at the coefficients, depending on the model, there are also some uh, caveats <coughs> for. Um, plain linear regression, all S, or rich regression, all the coefficients will be non-zero. And so it's, you can rank them using the coefficient, but this is actually sort of the effect size, and it's not entirely clear that the coefficients that are the biggest are sort of the most important in some sense. Um, also, you do need to uh, do something like the absolute value, and if you have a multi-class problem, it's hard to combine the, or you need to come up with some heuristic to combine the coefficients for the different classes to tell you what is most important uh, overall. So I want to go through some alternatives to uh, these sort of default feature importances and ways to evaluate um, how model depends on the feature. And then I want to do a quick um, case study and sort of comparing how do you behave in practice? Another thing that I want to briefly mention here is basically the, the simplest thing you could think of is drop feature importance, which is if I drop this feature and retrain my model, how much worse will it be? So here this is in the first of these three types that I talked about, this is about the family of models, not about a specific model. Um, so here, for example, given some data set and some model, I can cross-validate the model and I can remove every feature in turn and cross-validate and can see how much better or worse it got. This is actually not very um, useful in practice, particularly because you can't deal with correlated features. If you have correlated features, um, if you have, say you have two features that are perfectly correlated, if you remove one of them, then um, the, the model will be as good. And so both of these features, even if they're important, well, at least they both um, will be, have zero importance according to this measure. We'll come back to this measure in the context where it's more useful a little bit later in the lecture. Also, I mean, this is sort of slow because you need to train many models and you need to train uh, a new model for each feature. a sort of related method that is much more commonly used in practice and then goes sort of in the second class of analyzing one specific model globally is permutation importances. Here, you take your model and you take usually a validation set, so not the training set that you built your model on, but a separate set. And you compute the score um, using the whole data set as a baseline. And then for each feature, you basically shuffle this feature. So you're shuffling the feature means you remove all the 
um, information that was in this feature or anything that it might have related to the target. And so you check how much worse does the score get. So this tells you how much this particular model depends on this feature because it's, you'll see how much worse does it get if you shuffle it. This is, uh, I mean, the, the idea here is basically to integrate out over all possible values of a given feature. So you have a data point and you are interested in one feature. And for this one feature, now you try out um, basically all possible values. Trying out all possible values is sort of um, hard. And so instead, we sample a value randomly from the training set. Sorry, from, the, from this validation set that we're training on. Like permutation just means for each point we sample from uh, a value from one of the other points. This ensures that you replace the feature with the value that is drawn from the data distribution. So instead of just doing like a uniform grid or like uh, trying the values one, two, three, four, you draw from the data distribution by using the values from a different data point. If there's very strong correlations, this might end up very far from the original data though. Um, so if you, again, if your two features are always, uh, let's say they're always exactly the same, they're a copy of each other, if you shuffle one of them, they will be not e equal to each other. And so this point will be very far away from all the training data points. Um, but in general, this is sort of um, a pretty solid technique. Uh, compared to the thing before, the good thing is you only have to train the uh, model once, so you, or you have a trained model and you analyze this trained model. Um, so here there's this parameter and bootstrap, which is how often do you shuffle this column? So how often do I repeat this procedure of sampling a new value for my feature? And the more I do this, obviously the more robust this will get. So this is, yeah, this is uh, also um, kind of slow in particular if um, you have a big data set or if you want to do this uh, many times, but it's not too bad. There's two impl implementations, or three implementations that I want to point out. One is in Eli 5. This is explain like I'm 5. Um, it, it's a library that's sort of uh, compatible with scikit-learn and has some model explanation things in it. There's also a pull request in scikit-learn, so we'll have the permutation importance very uh, soon in scikit-learn. And uh, there's actually a very nice implementation for random forests that relates to the blog post that I linked to. The random forest implementation is faster than what I, um, well, okay, it's not, well, it's not necessarily as faster, but it's sort of uh, more effective than this because it uses the out of bag estimates instead of having a validation set. So this is sort of a very, um, very solid technique and it's very easy to implement. As you can see, it's like six lines of code, seven. There's two like newer methods that I wanna very briefly talk about. Um, so if you're interested in like model interpretability, you should definitely look more closely into these, but we don't really have the time to go into these in uh, great detail. Uh, these are Lime and Chap, or oh, Shop, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, so Lime is something that, that is a paper um, from a paper called Why Should I Trust You? Explaining the Predictions of Any Classifier. And this was a paper that um, got quite a lot of attention because it really opened up sort of how to do interpretability for uh, black box models. So for any model you can think of. What it tries to do is explain predictions for each point locally. And here I have this uh, figure from uh, the original paper. Basically, let's say you have um, these two data points, uh, sorry, these two classes, the red crosses and blue dots, and um, you have a model, and the model is sort of the, the shaded pink and the shaded blue, and you're asking about this red plus, and you ask, why did this model make this decision? Why did it predict this as, um, as red? 
plus. And the way it does this is it samples a bunch of points that don't necessarily need to be in a training data um, around this point. So these are like the big points you can see here and these points here. And then it builds a sparse linear model. So basically like a um, lasso regression that works that, uh, locally around this data point. And then it uses the coefficients of this um, regression model or this L1 penalized linear model to explain locally um, which features are important for this decision. So basically, uh, you have like a complex arbitrary model. It can be like a neural network or a support vector machine or a random forest. And in terms to, in order to explain uh, a particular prediction for a particular data point, you just sample locally around this point and you build a sparse linear model. And so you replace the complicated model with sort of an interpretable model, if you think that sparse linear models are interpretable. So I'm actually not going to go into more detail in, in this, but as I said, um, definitely something we can research more. There's a pretty good implementation uh, this is the original implementation by the authors uh, and they have many different variants and they have this for image classification with neural networks and for text and they have like nice user interfaces and you could easily talk to ours about just this technique. Is this sort of looks like a piecewise substitute in a way? Well, yeah, this is basically, um, it's a piecewise function in a sense in that basically every time you ask what about this data point, it will do a linear approximation locally there. Um, so yeah, so basically, but if you move your point like even a little bit, you'll have a different linear um, a linear model. So piecewise would be sort of a constant piecewise thing, but here you rebuild every time. It's more like com doing something like uh, computing the gradient or the tangent um, locally. The other thing that I wanted to uh, briefly mention is uh, Chap and Shapley values that I probably mispronounced. Um, they actually have, so also check out uh, the paper on this, uh, which is great anti-implementation. I wanna give you like a very rough idea, but again, they have uh, a lot of awesome visualizations and tools um, and lots of improvements on this. Uh, on the author website. And basically what it does, it does drop out importance for every subset of features. So earlier I said, well, if I remove a feature with dropout importance, if, I, um, if it's correlated, it doesn't matter. But he, so, so I don't get a good uh, score, even though it might have been important. In chap or in shapely values, so shapely values is sort of, is, uh, relatively like um, it's a standard technique from game theory uh, which here the authors um, adjusted for uh, doing general black box model explanation and this modification is called chap or chap so basically the, um, the way most of these work or the idea is that you look at all possible subsets of features and then you do th this um, dropout importance. And um, so I think actually, yeah, in practice they might do doing the permutation, but sort of I think in the theory uh, it is the dropout importance. So that means if a feature is correlated, while well, you compute the dropout importance uh, if to in uh, groups of features together with the one it's correlated in with, but also in groups of features where the feature it's correlated with is not included. And in these groups, it's gonna be important. And so you get useful importances in, in more cases. Um, this means you need to do exponentially much work though, because all possible subsets are like two to the power of um, number of features, and you can't possibly compute this for like even, like let's say 20 features probably even for 10, it's gonna be pretty hard. 
Um, so what they, they also proposed some fast variants of this. Um, so first, general fast variants that use um, approximate sampling strategies, not exit, exist. Sampling approximations exist. Um, and then they also have uh, particularly efficient variants for linear models and tree-based methods. Oh, I didn't mention this earlier, for the permutation importance, you actually can um, get uh, very efficient implementations for tree-based models because um, tree-based models basically allow you to integrate out a feature by ignoring uh, the feature in, when you do splitting. So actually in tree-based models, a lot of these things are sort of uh, nicer and faster. And in linear models, they're usually pretty easy, but if you have a general model, these techniques might be have to take a while. Uh, again, with Sharp, you can do local explanations for each example, uh, or you can aggregate them to get global explanations. So what I want to do now is sort of do a quick case study on a synthetic example to show you some of the pros and cons of these different methods. As a quick side note, we're gonna use something that I didn't introduce so far, so I want to very briefly introduce it. Um, there's a thing in scikit-learn called, or we call it the CV estimators or estimator CV. These are things, models that have built-in efficient grid search. So that exists for most linear models and also for a couple of other models. There's rich CV, logistic regression CV, lasso CV, and so on. If you call fit on these, it, they will do grid search internally using an efficient strategy, and they also have built-in uh, grids to search. And so I'm often using these because uh, it's faster than using grid search, uh, and I don't need to write a lot. So I can just write grid search CV, and I know alpha will be optimal. So I'm gonna use these to keep the short, uh, code a little bit short. Um, the caveat, though, is that it's a little bit weird to use these with pipelines. We talked about how it's important to include all the pre-processing in your cross-validation. If you put one of these guys into a pipeline, then the pre-processing is not included in the cross-validation because the cross-validation happens inside this guy. All right. So this is the toy data set that I spent uh, five hours generating yesterday. Um, so it's a linear data set. Uh, there's four features that actually matter and four features that are complete noise. And um, the first two features are perfectly anticorrelated, and features two and three are also perfectly anticorrelated, or nearly perfectly. So here's the, the covariance matrix. And so a good model would somehow use these first four features or select one of the two. And the, four, the last four features should never be any important. Here I created, um, basically, for this is very simple task, I created basically infinite amount of data, which is 100,000, so this will allow any model to be fit perfectly, so we don't really, um, so it's, it will not be for lack of data. So this, uh, if anything, doesn't work. So these models will not overfit, because um, basically, you only have to like train eight coefficients in a linear model and you have uh, 100,000 data points, you're not gonna overfit. I also actually did experiments with, uh, if you just use a subset of 100, but um, I don't think I have time to, to go through that. All right, so here's a couple of models that I want to look at. Um, Lasso, Ridge, Linear Regression, a Single Tree, and a Random Forest. And so this is a linear problem, so I generated it to be like their linear dependencies. So the linear models do pretty well. They all have like an R square of 0.54. They, because there's no overfitting, they all have exactly the same. Um, the tree, because I grid search it, also has um, basically the same. 
prediction the random forest is a little bit worse uh, but I didn't research search anything for that so maybe that's why so now I want to understand okay all of these model 3 um, look like they have the same uh, r-square roughly I want to see how do these models differ how do they depend on the input features and as I said sort of the most simple way to do this is for the linear uh, models look at the coefficients and uh, for the tree-based models look at the feature importances this is um, so here the, these are the zeros feature first feature second feature and so on and the bars are the different models one thing that you notice immediately is um, well there's several things um, here, Lasso and Bridge have neg negative coefficients, and um, Tree and RF are positive. That's because feature importances don't have a direction. They always just say, how important am I? So you could say this is a bad plot, and I should have used the absolute value, but I wanted to highlight this. The coefficients actually give you a directionality, and they say, if I uh, increase the first feature, then the response will decrease. The, the feature importances don't give you that. Um, because of the um, collinearities in the data, the linear regression model kind of goes crazy and we can mostly ignore it. If you look at the lasso, the lasso does what, uh, so this model, so here the ground truth is kind of sparse in the sense that only half of the features are actually important, the other ones are noise. So the lasso is actually um, sort of has a home advantage in the, that it is the right model for this. But what you can see is it picked, so the lasso is in blue, it picked feature num number zero and feature number two. And it completely ignored feature uh, number one, feature number three. And so this is something that's very typical of L1 based models. If there's highly correlated features, it will pick one of them. And if I resample the data set to a different train test split, it might pick the other one. So this here, this lasso allows me to understand this mod model very well. The lasso here, this is a test two coefficients that are non-zero, and it performs pretty well. So this is like a great model that's easy to understand. But it doesn't necessarily tell me everything about the data, because in the data, the feature number one and feature number three are equally important. And they're completely left out. So I have the lasso. I have like in this case here, because it's basically it's the ideal model for this kind of data, the way I generated it, um, you get a very compact, very nice model. And so if you want to understand this model, you can use the coefficients and it's sort of nice. If you understand, want to understand the data, it will not tell you how the data works, basically. All right. Um, Rich is um, maybe a little bit more informative here in that uh, it basically um, distributes the, uh, the coefficient along all of the correlated features. So basically, you can see these two are equally important for Ridge, um, and these two are equally important for Ridge. And Ridge also basically assigns zero uh, to any of these. If I subsample the data set, or like if I had much less data, if I have just 100 samples, like so, which is, would be a more realistic setting maybe, then Ridge would start to assign positive coefficients to these guys. So that's the trade of rich. Rich basically is more likely to assign positive or any coefficients um, to the features. I mean, they're all non-zero, but they're very small here. But um, with less data, um, they will become more noisy estimates. Whereas um, the lasso, even if I give it very little data, it will still just identify uh, some of these four important features. All right, the tree sort of also similar to Ridge showed all of the important features. 
in this case, um, it's a little bit unclear why it assigned more importance to this than to this. They are pretty much the same importance, but uh, this was also the one picked by Lasso. Um, what's interesting here is for the random forest. So I told you in the tree lecture, well, the future importances of the trees are sort of uh, a bit wonky, don't trust them too much. The random forest is sort of more stable. You can see that the random forest is more stable, but it basically assigns the same importance to the noise features as to um, this very important feature, like these two. And this is infinite data, basically. So this model could fit as, bad, as well as you could possibly fit a model, and still this feature importance tell you um, that these features are important even though they're complete noise. This is basically what the blog post is complaining about. And it's like, I mean, it's a valid concern. All right, questions about the, this so far? Oh, the question is where's entropy? I mean, the feature importances are the, the entropy decrease. So, um, so basically the red and the purple are uh, the entropy improvements according to the features and the other three guys, the blue, orange, and green are coefficient values. So these are like, these are, in a sense, they're very different things, but I think in this context makes sense to plot them in the same plot. All right, so now I wanna move on to uh, permutation importances. Oh, one thing I didn't mention about permutation importances is the great thing about these is also um, like the sharp value and the line, they are for black box models. So these, this here, the coefficient, this is something that's very specific to these models, and then now this is sort of one way to interpret these models. If I used a neural network or a support vector machine, I wouldn't have anything here. Permutation importance, I can just apply to any model. Um, and just show, I permute the feature and I show how does the output change. So at the top, I just replicated the old, the old uh, plot for comparison. At the bottom is permutation importance. And you can see that, the, you can see that the colors changed because I left the logistic regression out, so that's very unhelpful. But um, so if you look at the legend here, so random forest is red now, and you can see the re the feature importance is um, zero for all the noise features, which is uh, what we ideally want. Again, because this is just explaining what the model does, um, Lasso still has only the two features selected, and um, the rest is pretty much similar to what we saw before. Here also we now lost the directionality um, that we had in the coefficients. This just says how important is this feature for the model. It doesn't say anything about will this make it higher or lower. So maybe, um, since I don't have the plots for the small data here, another thing, so if you build the tree on a much smaller data set and run the grid search, you will get a much smaller tree. Here, because I had more data than I could use, um, the tree could basically figure out that both of these features are important because it could split like however often it wants. In, um, if you have um, less data, I did cross validation, I got a tree of depth three. So it's like a very shallow tree. And then it picked only one of these. So basically then it picked one of these two and one of these two. And that was it. So then the tree had the same problem as the, la at the lasso by picking out one of the uh, important features. Okay, the, the shaft values here again at the top is uh, the coefficients um, 
So here I look at a uh, global average of these values. Um, there are also, oh, both the permutation importance and the chap values are computed on the test set. And um, one thing that's sort of uh, nice about them is that they give you directionality, though I'm not entirely sure directionality here is correct. I'm also not super familiar with the library, so I might have like misused the directionality in some way. But generally, they should give you the direction in which the output changes given the feature. Um, actually, doing this on a random forest was kind of slow, so I enabled some heuristics for the random forest. Um, and now using these heuristics, actually, the it looks like it assigns some importance to the noise features again. I'm not sure if you run the slow, the slow sl thing, if you give it more time, maybe... Um, it kind of removes these. Uh, I'm not totally sure. Oh, a uh, question is why didn't I look at linear regression? So here I constructed a data set to have uh, very strong correlations between the features um, because that's sort of when these things struggle. Uh, and if you have that, then linear regression basically breaks. Um, so th this is, these guys here are not at 1.5, they're way off the chart. And so um, you can like fix this with like some PCA or some partially square stuff, but I didn't want to go into this. Um, but basically I constructed the problem in a way that the plain logistic regression will just fail. Um, maybe you said it before, but why did the sign flip for also because a lot of this? The, the sign of the coefficients? For, for linear regression? Yeah. Oh, the question is why is the sign for linear regression? Um, basically because they're very correlated and so they like, cancel each other out. Um, if you have very correlated features, basically all bets are off. Um, so in a sense, sort of the, the ridge model looks kind of nice. So I emphasized this before. This is uh, not like this is how these models will always behave, but I wanted to sh show off some particular properties, um, in particular that the random forest importances by default they assign uh, non-zero importance to unimportant things. Um, you can see that if, if you use permutation importance, these go away. Um, but you lose directionality and coefficients, for example, on a linear model. And also, I wanted to show that both like small trees and uh, lasso models basically pick among the correlated features at random. So again, this is sort of what I said about the inference. Um, if you look at this lasso model, um, I mean, the analysis for lasso in all of these is the same, basically, because the lasso model is very simple. Um, and it fits very nicely. But if you look at this model, you say, oh, feature zero and feature two is important and feature one is not important. So um, I don't know if like, uh, let's give a, a terrible example. And let's say feature zero was like um, zip code and feature one was like ethnicity. And uh, then you s say, oh, uh, this model doesn't depend on ethnicity, so it's not racist, but actually it's super racist because it depends on zip code. So uh, I think the question is, can you check for correlations first and then lo use lasso? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll yeah, uh, actually, oh, we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, but, but it's not always 100% clear what to do. Maybe. Well, there's, if you have very high dimensional data, there's lots of correlations. And Um, okay, cool. So I wanted 
talk a little bit more about some other techniques for model inspection. Um, in particular, uh, partial dependence plots. Partial dependence plots are um, basically in the, the second family of these methods that I mentioned. Uh, so these give you global explanations of models and they compute margin loss. Um, the, the feature importance we, we, we saw, they also kind of compute margin loss and um, they tell you how important is this feature. Partial dependence plots show you the actual dependence. So let me actually show you the picture first. So this is um, a gradient boosting model trained on the um, Boston housing data set and um, the five most important uh, features according to feature importance, which maybe we shouldn't have been using. And so what it shows is basically the marginal outcome depending on the, uh, the input. So you can see that basically integrating out the rest of the feature space, um, if you change the rooms, if you make room, if you give it more rooms, it will, um, the value will increase. If you increase LSTAT, the value will decrease and so on. So if you had a linear model, this would be sort of trivial because you would have a coefficient and it will have one slope per feature. But if you have a more complex model, like um, gradient boosting random forest neural network, um, then there's sort of n no clear way to see how does it depend on a single feature. This also, because it is a projection to a two-dimensional space, this will not give you a complete picture. So um, I don't have an illustration for this, but basically if in different, um, so let's say you have sort of a two-dimensional input space and a regression problem, and you have some data over here, and you have some data over here, and they go like this. If you look at it as a dependency on a single feature, it looks like it doesn't depend at all. Um, so basically by integrating over the space, you can uh, lose some information. So basically that H here is flat, doesn't mean H is not important. It means maybe um, H has interactions that are important, but as sort of the univariate um, thing, it, it, there's no clear dependency. So right now in scikit-learn, the partial dependence plots are only there for gradient boosting. So in, so in general, you can do this um, efficiently for all tree-based models and you can do them sort of by brute force for all models, similar to the permutation importance. And um, it sort of works the other way around by um, taking the data set, and if you want to compute the feature for a particular uh, partial dependence plot, you just replace this feature value everywhere with zero, zero and you compute the output. Then you, then you replace it with 0.1 and it was 0 0.2. And so you basically go over an interval and for each value in the interval you check for the whole data set, what is the average outcome if I give it this value. Okay, so here's how you can do it in scikit-learn with gradient boosting. As I said, scikit-learn right now only supports gradient boosting. In the next version, it will um, support it on general models, but not efficiently on random forests but with brute force, probably. Okay, so here I just fit my gradient boosting model. This is on the Boston housing data set, as I said, and I do plot partial dependence with the model, uh, the training data, which is used to build sort of the grid of, well, uh, which is used uh, in many ways. Um, and then here I look at the most important features, the six most important features, and um, then I plot this guy and I get this. I think I said everything. I said everything, good. Um, you can also do this uh, bivariate um, because you know your monitor has uh, two dimensions and so this allows you to look at interaction values 
Um, you could theoretically do this for higher dimensional spaces, but then uh, it would be computationally very expensive. And uh, also, it would be kind of impossible to visualize again. So here, this is Groom and Elstad, um, and uh, how they interact, uh, integrating out all the other features. You can also do the same for, for classification. If you do this for classification, you get um, usually one, one partial dependence for every class. So here is um, this for the iris data set. So there's three classes, um, the toes, diversity, color, and Virginica. There's four features, one, two, three, four. And for each of them, uh, for this brain boosting model that I trained here, we see the partial dependence. And uh, here, this is um, is this before or after the logit? No, it must be before. So this is the input to the, or this is the input to the softmax uh, in the multi-class. So the brain boosting has like a softmax output function for multi-class, and uh, this is what goes into the softmax. So high means the class is likely, low means the class is less likely. And so you can see if the pedal length is small, then it thinks it's Setosa. If it's like average, it's Percy Color, and if it's large, it's Virginica. And similarly here. And you can see uh, these are sort of less important or have less clear dependency. So the way I describe partial dependence plots is you take the data set, you replace one feature with a constant value, and you change this constant value and see how the average prediction changes. You can also not look at the average prediction, but look at what happens to each individual training point. Or, sorry. Uh, actually, you probably would want to do this on the, no, training point is fine. Um, we do each individual training point as you change a value. This is called Icebox, so there was like, I think the R implementation is called Icebox, and there was a paper on it. Um, and there's several Python implementations, and it basically, it's like partial dependence, but in, we don't aggregate over all the samples. But for each sample, you get a path. If, uh, if you would keep all uh, features fixed except for one feature, how does this feature influence uh, everything? And this would allow you, if there's interactions, to see these interactions. Um, there's um, this library PDP bo uh, box, which um, has like lots of nice uh, visualization of the f in features. Um, and one of the things it also has is it shows you bins in the training data. So these points here give you the density of the training data, and basically they tell you there is no data here, and that most of the data is here. And so this is also something important to know um, when you look at these plots. There's another library called um, Pysbox, um, which does the same thing with a slightly different interface. Oh my god, I'm way behind on time. Good. Um, cool. Questions about partial dependence plots? All right, so next thing I want to talk about is uh, feature selection. So why do we want feature selection? Um, so one reason that is I find often cited, but I actually haven't really seen any proof for, is to avoid overfitting. In practice, um, it's very rare that you get a better model by throwing away unimportant features. Um, unless, like, usually you had some reason why you included the feature in the first space, in the first place, so by excluding it, usually you don't get a much better model. What you uh, do get is possibly a more interpretable model, and you need to um, have less storage for your model and your data set, and you're possibly faster to uh, predict and train because uh, you're, um, 
data is lower dimensional. So if you basically just want to squeeze that as much out of your data as possible, which is rarely the case in practice, but let's say you're running a Kaggle competition, this will not help you. Uh, doing feature selection will probably not help you. If you uh, want to find a model that's more compact, um, then uh, this is a good idea. And this is also part of the homework. I think this is the last part of the homework, is trying to find a compact, compact model that is reasonably well. We'll talk about three kinds of um, feature selection, I guess. No, three distinctions. Um, you have supervised and unsupervised feature selection, so whether you use the target in the feature selection or not. You can do univariate feature selection, which means that you look at each individual feature, or you can do multivariate feature selection, where you look at um, how features interact. And you can do it model-based or not. So you can do it without thinking about the model you're going to use later, or you're going to you can use the model um, directly that you want to use for your regression or classification problem. So the first thing is what was just brought up is uh, unsupervised feature selection, which is most commonly using um, covariance. The, the reason why, so the idea in uh, unsupervised feature selection is basically to remove features that are redundant in some way. And you can do this with like many different techniques, but uh, a very common uh, one is that if uh, two features are highly correlated, drop one of them. Um, the problem there still is which one of them do you drop? drop? Um, so this would have been my reply earlier. Uh, this is sort of the reason why this might be a little bit tricky. If you want an interpretable model, so this is something that is very, very common in like modern inference and statistics setting. Um, in particular, if you want to use your linear regression without penalty, then this gets rid of the collinearities. And so you can fit your linear regression. In the data set that I created earlier that was like perfectly correlated, this would have made a lot of sense. But in the real world, this might discard important information. So two features might be very correlated, but the thing that they're not correlated on might be the important one. Do I have a picture? No. Too bad. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, variance-based. So. Actually, there's, uh, I th see a lot of people do this wrongly. If something has small variance, this means nothing to me. I scale my data, and so if I, after I scaled my data, the variance will be one. And so small variance doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, it just means you didn't scale your data. If you have zero variance, it's constant, and then you can clearly throw it out. The other thing that might be is that there's this is wrong. Not that there's few unique values. I, I, I wrote this in a very bad way. Um, but that it's almost constant. If something is nearly always zero and then has like three values of one, still the, um, the information in this will be limited. So if it's nearly constant, then um, you might want to throw it out. Okay, so, so I, I made, okay. Anyway, I made a different mistake than uh, Max Kuhn. Max Kuhn also wrote it wrong in his book, or confusingly, but in a, in a different way. Uh, when you say that it has small variance, does it mean much? Do you mean like it could be statistically important, or that it's small enough where you can count it? Oh, no, what I mean is, I don't think the term small variance has any meaning. Oh, okay. It just means you didn't scale your data, right? If you scaled your data, the variance is one. So. I mean, th there, there's, there is no such thing as small variance if you scale your data. If you don't scale your data, then it means, might mean you, you picked your units incorrectly. Then it depends on the units, right? If the variance is 0.1, then I haven't scaled it. After I scaled it, it's, the variance is 1. And now, is it important or not? I don't know. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why this few unique values you can't actually measure with variance 
uh, but you have to sort of look at the unique values and how often each unique value appears, and you can maybe look at a histogram to see if this happens. But yeah, so basically any variance threshold that's not zero, I'm very skeptical about. Um, one thing that is not um, exactly the feature selection, but is very related, is uh, principal component analysis. We'll talk more about this after the uh, after spring break, and that basically removes linear subspaces. So it doesn't remove a single row, it removes combinations of rows. And so it reduces also the dimensionality of the data. Possibly it'll make it harder to interpret, but it's uh, definitely a useful technique. So talking, coming back to the covariance, so um, first, first thing is that this is the covariance of the um, Boston housing data set. And this is a terrible way to show this covariance of the Boston housing data set because it looks like a checkerboard. And actually, I think if you do it with Seaborn, it will look nice. Um, if you don't use Seaborn, you have to do it yourself. Um, basically, you, if you want to plot a covariance matrix, you should sort them by their covariance. Th these two are, are the same plots where I reordered the columns. Um, and yeah, Seaborn can do that for you, or you, here I did it with like SciPy dendrogram. This thing on the left makes sense to me. I can see that, oh, there's a group of features that's correlated here. These are very highly correlated. This guy is not really correlated. Maybe there's like some correlation here. Here, I have no idea what's going on. If I ever see any report or visualization of you that looks like this, I'm gonna be screaming at you. Um, and I've seen a lot of these, and it's like, it's terrible. I mean, what, what's, what, is, what does it mean? Um, anyway, so, so um, let's go to supervised features. Oh, so the idea here would be, um, you pick out the most correlated features, you drop one of the two. So for example, here, these two are the most correlated features. I, um, I pick one of them and drop it. And um, then I can iterate this and I can stop when um, all the remaining um, co uh, covariances are below a certain threshold. This is actually not important in scikit-learn, I think. Maybe I should, I should add it. Um, cool. So now, Let's talk about supervised feature selection. So the first, the easiest one is univariate and model independent. And um, so basically, the idea is you pick a statistics and you check the p-value of the statistics. Alternatively, you can um, pick, you can look at the uh, effect size. Scikit-learn. So oh, it's missing one. Has f regression, f classification, chi two chi-squared, and uh, mutual information. And these are all, wait, this mutual information is also univariate, yes. Um, okay. Um, so these are all univariate. They basically look at a single feature at a time and look how related is this with the target. And so here you can see um, the F values or the P values, this is, uh, should be a t-test, f regression, and so um, you can see that uh, room, like LSTAT is the most important one because it's the smallest uh, p-value and uh, room is the second most important one. So here we didn't use any model or any, well we didn't use a machine learning model, we did use a statistical model that basically says the um, relationship is linear. So if I log transformed my data or if I log transformed my y, the outcome will be different. So here this is a case where maybe using a power transformer might make sense. Um, but so yeah, so you can do this with any of these functions and this will give you um, univariate feature importances. Um, so if you want to use this in scikit-learn to select features, 
uh, you combine these um, scoring functions with uh, feature selection uh, estimator. And there's many of them. For example, select k-best, select percentile, select false positive rate, and I think there's some others. Um, false discovery rate, right? Um, and basically, it you can specify different ways how you want to select features. Select k-best is the most straightforward. Um, it selects k features. So here I say uh, k equal to 2. Uh, uh, score font is f regression. And um, then it selects the two most important features. If I do things like I want to uh, select FDR as the false discovery rate, then you can control the false discovery rate using like an alpha. And you say that I want at most 0.5 false discoveries. And this is basically just a different way to select how many features you want to um, select given the p-values. And so here to select k-best is a standard cycle learn transformer, so you call fit. It just calls, um, computes the scores, you store the score, or it stores, into, stores, the, stores the scores internally. And, uh, and you can call transform, and transform uh, drops all but k in this case here. Okay, so just a brief comparison of um, like here's a rich model with scaling um, on all features, and then I also put uh, select k-best in the pipeline. So now the rich model only has two coefficients, and you can see that uh, the performance drops. Though so actually the, the the drop is not as dramatic as we might expect. Um, given that we went from 13 features to two features, you can see these two features together already explain a lot of the data. So apparently I also have, have a separate slide for mutual information. Um, mutual information actually is also um, a univariate measure, but it is, uses non-parametric statistics, meaning it doesn't assume a linear model actually uses sort of a neighbor's based model. So if you, um, here's an example on scikit-learn, which here shows if the dependency is like a sinus curve, then um, the standard tests will tell you there is no relationship between, because if you fit a line, it's, the slope is zero. But this is not parametric, so it can fi figure out their sinus curves and um, then works. It's obviously, it's sort of unlikely that there's a sinus curve in your data, um, but this also can work better with like skewed data if you don't um, change the skew. So if, there, if the relationship is monotonic but not linear, this might m work better than um, the other tests. So here's a com comparison. Uh, this is, uh, the F values are from um, F regression, from a T-test, where there's mutual information, and um, sort of, you can see here in this data set, they're actually pretty similar. They agree on what's the most important and what's the least important feature, and like in between, they're like slightly different, but they mostly give you the same ranking. All right, so next thing I want to talk about is uh, model-based feature selection. And so here the idea is you want to select features in a way that give you the best fit for a particular model. Um, so let's say you want a random forest, you want a subset of features that gives you the best random forest. As I said, it's like, I wouldn't usually ex uh, expect there to be like giant gains in, in performance by dropping features, but you could get a simpler model. So that's cool. So what's, I can use, say, uh, what is the least features I can use in my random forest, and it's got, still going to be great. Ideally, what you would do is um, exhaustive search over all possible combinations. So you take all possible subsets of the features, and uh, you check, if I train on this subset of the features, is my random forest uh, good or bad? But here, exhaustive is uh, infeasible, as uh, I mentioned earlier, um, because 
um, it's exponential in a number, of, like the, the number of uh, possible subsets is exponential in a number of features. Also, if you do this, you would try way too many models and you would have like overfitting and multiple hypothesis testing issues. So in practice, we're gonna use heuristics um, usually to either grow or shrink our um, feature set given some measure of feature importance by the model. So here this ties in again to the different kinds of feature importances we looked at, at before. Actually, I will only use the default feature importances here, so coefficients for linear models and the feature importances, the default feature importances for random forests. Given that we saw what we saw before, it's probably a better idea to use like a better way to compute feature importances, but that's not super easy with scikit-learn yet. So the easiest heuristic you can do is um, do a single fit model based importance. So you say, I fit a model and I select the k most important features or the k features that explain 90, or the features that explain 90% of my variance or something like that. Um, and so you, for this, you need to feature importance. As I said before, you have this for linear models, tree based models. Uh, for Lasso, this particular sort of natural because Lasso has exactly zero coefficients. So, um, it's very clear which one are important and which one not. The, this is, if you, even if it is with a linear model, it's quite different than doing the tests because here this is multivariate. So if you have um, very correlated features and you do univariate tests, if one is important, both are important. And so if you have, um, if your mo most important feature has a copy, then a univariate test will pick these two as the two best features, which is maybe not what you want. If you use uh, Lasso, as I said earlier, it will pick one of the two randomly. So it depends a little bit what you want. Do you want to understand the data or do you want to have a compact model? Then one or the other is uh, important. Here, um, in this example, the Lasso coefficients are actually pretty similar to um, uh, to the f values, and you can see that um, actually, I think only two lasso coefficients, or maybe even none of them, are exactly zero. Um, so I did lasso CV, so it does it the, the alpha automatically, and yeah, oh yeah, here you can see it. None of them are zero, so lasso didn't kind of lasso told me all features are important. If I change the alpha parameter, I might get a less optimal model but I can get a model with less features. So here, for example, I said alpha equal to one, and now um, I'm only using one, two, three, four, five features. And um, so now it would be, I could just select those. To actually go, uh, do this selection, in scikit-learn you can use select from model Select from model will compute feature importances given a model and then drop the non-important features. So select from model basically takes a model and uses the feature importances to create a pipeline or to, to create a transformer that drops the features. So here um, I put lasso CV in, I set a threshold, everything that has a coefficient lower than this will be dropped. I um, fit in the training set, and then I transform. If I transform, I lost, ooh, how many features are there? 13, I lost two features. Uh, because two features were, uh, had, very, had very small coefficients. And so here is a comparison of using Lasso for feature selection and then building a ridge model on top. I think actually someone asked me, can you do this? Uh, was you right? Was it not? <laughs> um, see? <laughs> so here we use Lasso to select uh, a feature, um, or to select features, so it only drops two features, and then um, we use ridge to 
built a linear model on the remaining features. We could also use this lesson model directly if we wanted to. Um, and so you can see that it's like a tiny bit worse. Dropping these two features made it a tiny bit worse, but probably um, in any real application it probably wouldn't matter. What, is, what did I do now? Ah, don't worry about it. Oh yeah, I mean, we, we could grid search the, la, the, oh. So here, the way Lasso selects the alpha is to get the best possible regression model in, with Lasso. We could also grid search alpha so that we have the best possible pipeline. These are different objectives. Um, cool. Okay, so this was like basically we fit. Yeah. When you have the threshold which is very close to zero, does that account? And I might be wrong, but any coefficients can be negative. If, you know, what if it's negative so it's less than? But the threshold's on the absolute value, okay. so um, yeah. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. Okay. And here, so basically for lasso it actually probably would have made sense to even pick a smaller threshold. So for Lasso, basically we want to check are they zero, basically zero or not zero. And that's sort of what I'm doing here. All right, so there's no way we're gonna go get three slides. So this was just build a single model, throw away the unimportant features and keep the rest. This is like basically the most extreme you can go from trying all possible subsets. Um, a different approach would be fit the model, find the least important feature, remove it and iterate. So always drop one feature at a time and rebuild the model. Or you can drop three features at a time. Alternatively, you could start with a single feature, ask which model was the single feature is the best and then try to add more features. So I'm first gonna talk about the first one, which is also known as uh, recursive feature elimination. So in scikit-learn, the recursive feature elimination, or RFE, again, uses the feature importances um, or the coefficients, or absolute value of coefficients, similar to select from model, but instead of Selecting a subset K, it literally removes uh, one by one. This is obviously much slower than doing this one step selection um, because basically you have, so here the runtime is number of features minus number of features to keep divided by step size, where step size is how many features do you throw out in each step. So if I have 100 features, I want to keep 10, I need to build uh, 90 models if I drop one every time. And so yeah, here it's implement, this is implemented in the RFE. I'm using linear regression this time, of course, why not? And um, so here I call features to select equal to one. This will say, basically, it will remove each feature until only one is left. And so it will give me a complete ranking of what it thinks are the most important pe uh, features. And um, this is plotted here again, um, comparing the linear regression coefficients to the ranking given by the um, RFE. So these could be like very different. Uh, in this case, they're actually not that different, uh, which probably means there's not a lot of correlation going on. Um, oh yeah. And so I was unhappy that it didn't get better. And so I put polynomial features in and then did feature selection and then it got better. Um, so, I mean, polynomial, adding polynomial features uh, blows up the space uh, of a lot, and um, so doing feature selection then is uh, makes sense. Also, here I skip. Maybe I shouldn't skip this. So, RFDCV is similar to the like Lasso CV and so on. Something that does internal cross validation. RFDCV does internal cross validation to find the right number of features to keep that gives you the best classification or regression accuracy, or R squared. Am 
I gonna? Okay, I'm gonna go two minutes over because I don't want to start this over again. Um, so you can also use wrapper methods. This is actually doing the recursive feature elimination, uh, doing exactly the same, but using the drop feature importance. So here, the RFE and RFECB in scikit-learn, they use the feature importance that are built in. It, you can, if you use the drop feature importance, you, can, you get a sequential feature selector. So basically, sequential feature selector does the drop importance and uses it to drop one feature at a time. Here, um, to do the drop importance, as we saw earlier, um, we need to do cross-validation. So for each feature we, um, we want to drop, I need to run cross-validation. So if I have, so for the first feature I want to drop, I need to uh, run n models times number of cross-validation folds. So this is pretty expensive. Um, Um, question is, does this work for categorical data? The thing is, in, um, it's, that's tricky in scikit-learn. So in scikit-learn, because you would use one hot encoding, it would probably um, drop levels and not, whole cate not categorical variables as a whole. And that's really annoying me. Um, because R should never be better than scikit-learn. Just kidding. <laughs> no, but it's like, um, cool. So yeah, so the sequential feature selector, oh, Says. This is in MLX10, which is not scikit-learn. It's going to be in scikit-learn soon, but if you want to use this, um, you can use MLX10. And basically, yeah, you can do this in a forward or in a backward uh, fashion. And um, so here, this is, as I said, this is black box because the drop, um, drop feature importance is black box. You can do it for any model, but you have to refit the model over and over again. 